Sports Talk Chicago. Here with John Zaglul, and we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's the former sports director and lead sports anchor at ABC7 Chicago and a three-time Emmy Award winner. Please welcome Mark and Greco to the program. Mark, it's great to have you on. How are you? John, thank you very much. I'm doing well. Moving on and having a good time, and I really appreciate you uh, making time for me on your show here. What have you been up to? Well, I tell you, I really enjoy being a civilian and being a casual fan. And I think like a lot of people at this point, I'm trying to shed the pandemic pouch and get back in shape. And uh, things are loosening up a little bit. So I've been uh, doing some traveling again and uh, just exploring a a lot of options and opportunities. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of nice living this different lifestyle. But uh, I will admit that it's tough. It is an adjustment after basically 50 years, you know. How bizarre is it to not be at work or to not have that schedule? Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy, you know, in, in a physical sense. You know, my sleeping patterns are different. And uh, again, you know, going to bed late, working late, stuff like that. Um, it's a challenge now to get up early. You got to go to bed early because I want to make sure I get to the old country buffet by four o'clock, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure things will settle in, you know. When's the last time do you remember being in this position? Never. I've never been fired. I've never been transferred. I've never been demoted. Um, this is the first time uh, that I've left a job when it wasn't on my terms or my timetable. So um, I have to say it was a punch in the face. I mean, obviously. Um, didn't see it coming, but uh, you know what? I'm moving on. I, I really am. I, I'm really glad that uh, I didn't, I don't know, this is a weird thing to say, but I was always embarrassed by accolades and tributes and things like that. And I would always joke that, gee, I got a year and a half left on my deal. And I kind of dreading having a big going away party. I just kind of want to slip out. Well, I got my wish. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, on, not on my terms, as I said, but I have to tell you, you find out who your true friends are, both in and outside the business when something like this happens. And the absolute tidal wave avalanche of public support on social media, coupled with the local and national backing of virtually everyone I've ever worked with or known or competed against in the business has been really humbling and overwhelming. It's just been, it's just really been crazy and so much appreciated. Would that have been your last deal, do you think, at ABC? Oh, yeah, I think so. You know, I'm 69 years old. I mean, it's, uh, I've still got plenty of juice left. It's just that, you know, where do I want to use that juice? Um, yeah, I had planned on leaving uh, in 2022 uh, at the end of my deal. And, you know, perhaps doing a little radio or podcast or this and that or doing nothing. You know, I'm really blessed. I have three wonderful sons who have uh, given me some incredible, uh, a trio of daughters-in-law and I have three grandkids. I mean, it's just spectacular. I'm the luckiest guy in the world and my priorities have changed and I can look back on, you know, a pretty exciting career. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to be able to hitch a ride on this crazy train that was Chicago sports from 1982 to the present, you know? Do you want to stay in TV right now? Would you be open to that or radio or podcasting? Well, you know, I was always a radio guy from day one. Uh, that was my first love. My goal in life, when I was eight years old, listening to my little transistor radio in Buffalo, New York, was to be a top 40 rock jock. And I used to be able to get WLS and Super CFL and listen to Larry Lou Jack and, uh, you know, John Records Landecker and uh, Dick Biondi. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what I wanted to be. And for whatever reason, Chicago was always my goal. I just thought it was just this magical place um, as a kid. And that's what I aspired to. So, you know, radio sounds great. Podcast, there are no restrictions. I could say whatever I want to say. Uh, <laughs> no boundaries, which could be interesting. I don't know about television. Um, again, I have to say I've really been flattered by a lot of inquiries, offers, and possibilities that I'm weighing right now. So 
I don't want to go into detail about that, but uh, I am free to go work wherever I want to work, whenever I want to work. Um, I do not have a no compete clause. And uh, so I can really do everything or nothing, John. <laughs> are you seriously considering those offers or are you leaning maybe towards retirement more? Um, I have to say that right now at this point in time, I'm considering all options. Okay. Um, but, you know, how many people get to read their own obit and attend their own funeral and then be able to go on with a fresh new life? You know, people have been so wonderful. I've never had to try to explain myself or speak for myself uh, following my departure because everyone's done it for me. And I can't thank them enough. And, you know, I can look back on all the things that I did with my producers and cameramen at, at both stations and have forged these incredible friendships and great working relationships. And we have so many great stories. And a lot of people say, ah, geez, you just embellish the hell out of that. Well, maybe a little bit, but for the most part, it's all true because we lived in the wild, wild west back then. And, you know, I am looking forward now, though, having had this great career that I'll always savor. I'm looking forward to a bunch of new things. I have been approached about doing commercial voiceovers. I went to art school when I was younger. I've always been into uh, designing logos for teams and leagues and, uh, you know, stuff like that. I'm a big car guy. I love classic muscle cars and hot rods and have been looking at perhaps doing uh, television shows that involve that kind of stuff. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. Mark G. and Greco here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, are you at all concerned about the future of media? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially local television news is so challenged now. There are so many other platforms. Uh, social media, while a great phenomenon, is also extremely dangerous where everyone, qualified or not, has an opinion. Everyone's an expert. Everybody can hide behind their their Twitter handle and their Facebook page and just lash out and be totally irresponsible. Um, but it's also given players, leagues and teams an opportunity to break their own stories. And unfortunately they don't really need us anymore. Every D one university, every league, every professional sports team, they have their own media departments and they pump out all these great, really well-produced features and everything uh, really pumping their product. But of course, if there's any kind of controversy attached to that franchise, they're never going to deal with it. And I don't foresee uh, anybody ever being back in a locker room again. I think the pandemic just accelerated the inevitable where sports reporters will never be in a locker room again. It'll always be a sterilized, sanitized, homogenized zoom interview or news conference in a press room, um, you know, so we had so much access back, especially in the eighties and nineties. And then in the mid two thousands, it started to become very restrictive. And I think, uh, everyone's used the excuse of the pandemic to set the tone for the future. And I, and I don't think it's healthy. Forget about sports because to me, sports was just all about fun and entertainment. And while we did have to deal with some serious issues from time to time, more so now than in the past. Um, I just think that news is in jeopardy, serious news. I mean, we are the news source we choose, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, whatever, right wing, left wing, it's all attached with opinion and propaganda and really subversive stuff. And you can't get an objective newscast anywhere these days, it seems. And so forget about sports. News is in jeopardy in general because there are so many subversive forces out there uh, sabotaging us, you know, infecting our brains with all this subliminal stuff via social media. Is freedom of speech a problem? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. It's a problem. Hey, look, I consider myself a liberal Democrat and uh, many people say since you left, maybe you ought to adjust your position to be a moderate. But I, uh, I have to say that the pendulum has to swing too far. There has to be an overcorrection. 
and an overreaction to get to where we need to be as a society. But I think in the process of trying to make things right, um, freedom of speech is being retarded a bit. Uh, but I think we have to deal with each case individually. Sure. And I, I don't think we can make blanket blanket statements. I just think, uh, you know, we should always have our freedom of speech, but it can't be abused to where it, it, it's hurtful and evil and attack filled. You know, how do you regulate that? I, I really don't know. I don't know. But we're getting pretty deep here, man. <laughs> <laughs> how difficult does that make your job? Well, obviously, it, it made it very difficult. Um, you know, again, radio, a podcast, uh, things like that. You have a lot more freedom. You have a lot more time, just basic time to develop a thought, to listen to someone else's position, to take calls, to interact with viewers and listeners. Uh, you're doing a three-and-a-half-minute sportscast, which over the years has become a three-minute sportscast, which is now down to two-and-a-half minutes in many cases. It's tough to get out of that box and really do something creative and expand a thought but my challenge always was no matter how little time i got in a newscast that's now being jammed with uh with video and stories uh, and sports has always been pushed to the back and i get it i i understand i always challenge myself to still get nine or ten pieces of video in a two and a half or three minute sportscast i love that I love that challenge of making a rapid fire delivery and try to be creative. And I think I learned how to write first and foremost in high school taught by the Jesuits, which is what they were known for. And then again, I learned how to write in radio when I was doing news where it was a quick headline service on a top 40 rock station. So you had to be able to tell a story in one sentence and that's a challenge. And I think I brought that to TV sports where, you can just cram it full of information and video and graphics and try to be funny and creative no matter how little time you had. Are you the last of your generation? Um, well, uh, you know, Dan Roan is still over at WGN and uh, there's still a few of us hanging on. But I think my class, which was basically the people who came in around 82, 83, yeah, we're definitely – we're definitely the last of that generation. And we, we all had great runs, you know, and, uh, you know, Luke and Ellis is a great friend of mine and, and, and Dan is just a mensch and it, and Howard Sudbury was my buddy. And I just had a great run with these guys. And while we were quote unquote competitors, I think we all had fun working together and competing. And it's just, it's just not the same. Like I said before, there's no access the pandemic has separated everyone. It's just Zoom interviews. You're so detached. People are doing their shows from home. I mean, I was lucky to be able to go into the studio and still work in my office and work in the studio with one other anchor. And that's the system that was set up there, which I really appreciated because I'm not one of those people that enjoy working from home at all. And, <laughs> you know, it just really just takes away so much energy from the show. And I just always appreciated the fact that I was able to go in during this past year plus, you know. Do you have any regrets based on everything that's happened? Well, I have one major regret, um, which, of course, was the Walter Payton situation. Um, I was always a wise guy, a smart ass shot from the hip. And uh, during the time Walter had lost a lot of weight, we saw him at Jared Payton's news conference announcing where he was going to go to college. And, uh, I asked Brad Palmer, who was on the scene covering the news conference, they asked Walter, you know, about his appearance. And he said, oh, I overtrained for a marathon. I was taking too many diuretics and got out of control. So I, like an idiot, I should have known better anyways. Obviously that didn't sound like a great excuse, but I jumped on it and said, oh, you know, looks like Gandhi. I could probably take him. Ha ha. Because our relationship was always teasing, fooling around, playing practical jokes on one another, taking shots at one another. And of course that crushed him. He did not want people to know exactly what was wrong at the time. And when he cried at his news conference and said, God bless those who 
who don't feel for me. I knew he was speaking directly to me. It crushed me. It tore my heart out. And that will always be my biggest regret. And nobody wants to hear that part of the story. Um, when my name comes up, even to this day, there are a lot of people who bring that up. Um, but I tried to call Walter nine or 10 times after I realized what I had done and realized what the real story was. And then finally, a few months later, he called me in my office. Wow. And with his little voice said, Hey, you're a hard guy to get a hold of. I'm like, Oh my God, Walter. Um, and he said, look, I lied to you. I was putting people off. I didn't want anybody to know at the time. I forgive you. And he knew he was dying at that point in time. And he went out of his way to call me and say, I forgive you. I mean, that is always going to sit with me forever. Um, I mean, that was a gift. That was an incredible act of forgiveness. But at the same time, that is the biggest regret in my career that I'll always carry with me. Mark Greco here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, what's your legacy here in Chicago, do you think? My legacy? Well, people who know me in the business, I'd like it to be that I worked really, really hard at trying to make it look easy. And I had this work ethic that I inherited from my dad and other people in my family. Um, and the other part is I never took it seriously. I was always looking to have fun with it. It was never life and death uh, for the most part. And it's supposed to be pure entertainment. And, you know, I liked pushing the envelope and even stepping over the line a few times because that was me. I'd like to think that I was just being myself on the air. And you have to be true to yourself, especially in a provincial market like television. I mean, like Chicago, where people on television have to be themselves or they're ferreted out as a phony immediately. The fans in this town you know, you better be telling the truth and you better be yourself. And I would like to think that I was, I was always in trouble in grammar school and high school. I was always a problem. I was always very outspoken. I was always a wise guy. Uh, I always, you know, was in jug, which is detention for those who didn't go to Jesuit high school. Um, and I got that from my mom. My mom was really outspoken in your face. So you know, while there are certain things, like I said, that I shouldn't have done or said, for the most part, I was just trying to be me and just trying to have fun. And I hope that's what the legacy is. Do you think all this stuff helped or hurt it? Or are you even worried about it? My departure? Yes. Um, like I said, how many people get to leave like that? are forced to leave like that and have their reputation intact. I feel as though my re reputation is intact because so many people have rallied around me and I'll never get over that. So I think it's actually helped. Like, again, as I said earlier, who gets to read their own obit, go to their own funeral. And the testimonies have been just ridiculously, you know, rewarding and off the charts. So you know, I'm at the point now where, okay, enough is enough. <laughs> let's, <laughs> well, let's move on. But, I mean, I, I try to thank each and every person who's ever posted anything on Facebook or Twitter or has called me or emailed me or whatever, whether I've met them or not. Uh, I'll always, always appreciate it. How proud are you personally of your run, going from Buffalo to Dayton to Chicago and lasting this long in the business? I'm very proud of it because it it was a nasty business where a lot of people didn't last very long. And, um, you know, once again, I was lucky to be in the golden era, the heyday when we all made a lot of money and it was all really exciting and it was viciously competitive uh, to the point where there were physical confrontations, there was sabotage. <laughs> yeah, it was the most exciting time for our business. Very proud just to have lasted this long. I remember my first day at Channel 5 in 1982, walking into the merchandise mart. I was absolutely terrified. You know, this is the big time. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, I had a guy like Chuck Coppock protect me and show me the ropes. And then, you know, I'd stand back and watch Chet and Johnny Morris and Tim Weigel go at each other in the paper every day, you know, with TV critics fanning those flames. And I, you know was an observer and learned what to do and what not to do and how to handle myself. And, you know, it was like uh, a young quarterback being drafted, but had to sit behind the veteran quarterback for a while. That served me really well. 
You mentioned sabotage or the competitiveness. Can you talk more about that? Is there a specific story? Well, you know, there were times when accidentally on purpose, somebody would kick out somebody else's live shot cable or, <laughs> so, you know. Accidentally on purpose? Uh, yeah, you know, little technical <laughs> snafus or, I mean, one of the greatest stories was uh, the first NBA championship run of Bulls and Lakers out in L.A. Scotty Pippen was going to be on Arsenio Hall show at Paramount Studios. That was a CBS show. We asked Scotty if we could ride with him. We're in the limo. We're standing out of the sunroof singing I Love L.A. We're doing a great interview on the way. And uh, Jay Levine from Channel 2 <laughs> was camped outside the studio waiting to get the exclusive. And he's camera rolling and ready to go. And I get out of the limo. And those are the most rewarding moments when you can beat the competition like that. But it's taken a step further. My producer, Bob Vorwald, who is just absolutely incredible, he posed as a CBS producer, not an NBC producer. And he got the videotape of the show and we ran the heck out of it. And those are the kind of things you just did what you had to do in the Wild West. You'd cheat if you had to, you know, and uh, now, again, nowadays, none of that stuff would ever be possible. <laughs> Mark Gian Greco here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, are the Bears bound to make a mistake in the draft? Absolutely. And I'm I'm rooting for them to have another terrible draft because we're <laughs> running out of ways to criticize Ryan Pace. It's absolutely ridiculous up there as long as the McCaskies have owned the team, the whole George Hallis, you know, uh, legacy and everything else. They still really know nothing about football. No one's held accountable. There's no system of checks and balances. Ryan Pace was supposed to be the young, hot general manager, stud, taking chances, gambler, really super knowledgeable. Matt Nagy, the young, fresh head coach. And it's all kind of just gone sour. And it's, it's pretty obvious they don't know what they're doing. And I've always maintained that most NFL teams, with all the TV money and everything else, we're so addicted to that sport and that league. It's part of our culture. They don't have to win. They just need to keep making money. And we're all addicts, and everybody's going to buy season tickets, and everybody's still going to watch, no matter how bad they are. So um, I am convinced that they truly are going to do everything they can to really take a chance and try to make a huge splash and try to trade up and give away the farm. But at the end of the day, which is tomorrow night, finally, we've been waiting forever. <laughs> Uh, it's not going to happen, and they're going to be stuck, and they're going to draft a cornerback or a defensive end you never heard of, and that's going to be it. Um, the whole Russell Wilson thing, you know, they made a huge push for that. Uh, they may try to revive that, but, you know, once you get past number three in the draft, that's going to set the tone for the rest of the picks, and, you know, we'll see what happens there, but I have no confidence that they're going to – get a diamond in the rough. I have no confidence that they're going to get a quarterback. I have no confidence in any of their football moves at all. It's, it's an absolute joke. And I got to tell you, it's hard to watch nine innings of baseball. Uh, I can't watch the bulls. Uh, I watch the Hawks cause I'm a diehard hockey fan, but you know, these are tough times for Chicago sports fans because nobody's going anywhere except perhaps the white Sox. And, What's unfortunate there is only half the city cares, which has always bothered me. So I kind of miss not being in the mix because it's easy to do a good sports cast if there's a lot of stuff happening. But I always love the challenge of doing a really great sports cast when nothing is happening. <laughs> and it's the same mundane stuff every night. Cub highlight, Sox highlight, Bulls highlight, Hawks highlight. And then I always tried to find something funny at the end, a kicker or a closer to save the show. But if we could come up with some funny graphics and play with the video and, you know, use the best sound bites and, and try to have fun with that. Uh, my producers, Mike Johnson and Larry Snyder, we would always say, hey, that was a good nothing show. If we liked <laughs> that, it, a good nothing show is better than, wow, we're packed with too much good stuff tonight. You know, having nothing and making something out of it was always better than having too much stuff. What's the worst year that you remember in covering Chicago sports? The most depressing year that you had to cover on the news? Well, I would say this past year, 
But uh, thinking back, there were some really lean years with the Hawks before Rocky Wirtz took over and John McDonough and Jay Blanc and brought it into the 21st century, even the 20th century. Um, you know, everybody knows the, the, the Cubs legacy. And uh, once again, I, you know, I was fortunate to be part of all these teams breaking the trend, you know. So there were many, many years where it was very lean, but. It's always more fun to rip teams and players than to be a rah-rah homer. So when everybody was bad, I thought it was much more fun when everybody was bad. You know, because as fans and sportscasters and sports writers and everything else, we have all the answers, you know? None of us ever played at that high level. And none of but we had all the answers. We could we could coach any team and we could straighten out any player. So, you know. I always, I always enjoyed that part of it more so than being a rah-rah homer and just blindly following a team no matter what. You got to call these people out. You got to call organizations out. You have to keep everybody honest. And again, back to worrying about the news business in general, you do have to have objective third-party insight. You can't allow leagues, franchises, players, and so forth to write their own stories and to push their own agenda. They have to be called out if if something is wrong or if they're not performing. Have you ever been called out by a team? Have you ever been told, stop criticizing us, this is too much? Oh, yeah, many times. And I remember the one time when one of his many Sunday night appearances uh, with Johnny Morris on Channel 2, Mike Ditka, who obviously had celebrated a victory too much or drowned his sorrows in a loss a little too much, I remember one night, you know, Johnny starts out saying, well, my tough loss today. And he just went off going, before we get to the game, I just want to say one thing. I'm never going to talk to that Mark Gian Greco again. He's a jerk. He's an idiot. And and Johnny's like, okay, okay, Mike. All right, Mike, no, we don't want you to be talking about the competition. And he just went off on me. And, yeah, there were a lot of guys that had no interest in talking to me at all. There's a whole litany of people, but I, I like I, Jerry Reinsdorf was not a big fan. Um, you know, I think I rubbed Michael Jordan the wrong way a few times, but I like to think that I had a pretty good relationship with him. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people just thought of me as this guy's a wise guy just trying to make a name for himself. But no, I was just trying to have fun. And a lot of people have thinner skin than others, you know.